afternoon. I'm helping organize a challenge that's called Blacklight, which is an online uh, security and coding challenge. And if you want to be part of it, go to blacklight.ai. Um, the part that I'm doing there is kind of trying to do a proof of concept for, the for some of the challenges to see if it's feasible to solve it within a reasonable time, with a reasonable effort, and then if it is good, then it goes to a conference or some other event that it goes to. And in November, I was asked to proof of concept this challenge, which breaks into the interface of a security camera, and then you have to do some kind of things there. And that's how it looked. So pretty simple, right? You're going to brute force there, and you're going to try to log in every time. You only have a very finite limit uh, of combinations and a CAPTCHA. And this CAPTCHA is trained on a model that was given in advance. And what happened in real time that you had to uh, get this model as kind of the solution of the puzzle before. And then you pretty much can use this existing model to guess the CAPTCHA. And so you get the model, you inspect it, which means you run this uh, CLI command that says how many inputs, how many outputs, the names of the nodes, which you can later use in the code. You load the model, and then you do attempt to log in by opening a cookie jar, getting the image, using machine learning to predict it, taking the pin that you have in this current loop, and taking both to do the login. And in case the capture fails, your cookie jar helps you to just refresh this, get the new CAPTCHA, and with the same pin, try to log in. And this is how it looked in the conference, in real time. So you can see this internal uh, IP, and that was the screen that, it, or what, was, what the camera was capturing. And this, you can read the full details in the Gophers Academy blog in December 28th. We can go to my repo as well. And what's interesting about this is that I did this with machine learning. And the only thing I used was Go and TensorFlow. And what I want to talk about today is that TensorFlow is available when all you have is Go. So let's say your backend is completely Go. Or let's say you maybe know some Python, but it's been a while since you did it. Or really, you want to tell somebody who's telling, oh, machine learning, then you kind of need Python developers, right? Then to this, you can say, no, I don't. You know, I have Go, and that's enough. <laughs> and then what I'll show you today is a, a bit more about machine learning and the project that you saw, which was a fun pet project, kind of, and how we use Go at work for TensorFlow. No drones. <laughs> so how do we machine learn? What do we do? Step one, we define the problem. For example, is it classification? Is it regression? What is success for us? It can be something like 98% precision, but it can be something like give me a response within two seconds. It changes from problem to problem, from use case to use case, and it the most important thing you start is actually saying, what do you want to do? What's the problem you're solving? The next step is getting the relevant data. So let's say we want to do something like uh, getting text translated in, from an image to a string, and we want to do it in English. Then obviously, we don't want uh, to happen to have text that has Chinese, or even characters like the Spanish and Nya. So we need to have our data relevant, and we need to have it um, in a way that will make our model better. And then we're going to prepare the data. So we're going to clean it. For example, we're going to remove blurry images, and we're going to pre-process it. So for example, we're going to have uh, the median uh, to, of the pixels to be zero, which is the same processing pre-processing that we're going to do on the real data that we're going to uh, later use to predict. We're going to also randomize it. So for example, our model will not end up doing things like guessing, oh, if it was, well, I was trained 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I have now an 8, then it definitely means I have a 9. We don't want this to happen. 
we're also going to split the data. So if you have 100 images, you're going to take around 75 for the training and around 25 for the testing. So you're not going to train your model with all your data set. And then we're going to choose a model. And the model depends on things like the learning task, as we defined it in the beginning, on the type of the input, if it's an integer, if it's an image that's going to be a byte array, or if it's, for example, strings, which is predicting what's going to be the next word. And the possible number of categories. So let's say we have hot dog, not hot dog. We have two categories. If we have digits, we have 10 possible categories. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But if we have faces, it can be billions of categories. And all those and others uh, define which is the model that's best for you. And once you chose your model, we're going to train it. So there's the representation, uh, the mathematical representation of the model. And the first thing we do is assign random values to it. And then we're going to make a step, which means we're going to predict the data, see if it's correct or not. And we're going to make changes to our random values. In this step, we're using the train data. So that's the 75%. And yes, we basically take the data we trained with, and then we make the prediction with it. And this, for some of you, may remind a bit the way you solve partial differential equations. You take random values, you make a step, you become a bit closer, and you iterate as much as you want, depends on the trade-off, until you reach the solution that is close enough to the answer. And TensorFlow is used for things like that, as well as for predictions. And then we finish training, and now we're going to do evaluation, which means we're going to take the ready model, and we're going to run it on the test data. So that's the 25% that's left. And based on the results, we're going to do tuning to the hyperparameters, which is not done automatically, unlike the first, what we saw here, that changes every step. This one changes the values automatically. Here, this is manually. And in many times, after you do this prediction and you see the values, you're going to go back to step four or even to step five and you're going to retrain your model, maybe, with a different equation, or you're even going to choose a different model, because you're going to realize suddenly it was not the right choice. And when you're done doing all of this, then your model is good to go, and we're going to start <coughs> predicting. And TensorFlow is one of those tools you can do machine learning with. And TensorFlow, the definition, is an open source software for machine intelligence. It's used mainly for machine learning applications as neural networks. And as there was a bit of spoiler in the previous talk, but really the name suggests it, TensorFlow has tensors that flow. <laughs> and the tensor is just a representation of this mathematical entity that is many times a vector or a matrix of a higher dimension. And you define it with two parameters, the type of the data that you store there and the shape of it, which is number of dimensions and values per dimension. If this picture scares you, this is not exactly the model from TensorFlow, but that's actually a physical from physics uh, tensor. But finding an image of a tensor is pretty hard, so that's close enough. Right, we're all about trade-offs. <laughs> the, the, the tensor used in TensorFlow is actually less complex. So if you're comfortable with this, you're good. And those tensors, they flow through this graph. And you can say that the graph is the model. And each node of the graph is an operation. And when it flows there, it has a value in each of the node. And you can inspect it and look at the intermediate results. And when we did uh, inspect to the model in the beginning, if you remember, this, when you run the CLI tool that does inspect to a model when you receive it as a black box, it gives you the parameters like the name of each node, how many of those, and so on. Sure. 
as TensorFlow is open source, it's very much community driven. So you can always go to GitHub and contribute to TensorFlow in your favorite language. And you can also make use of the nice tooling that's becoming more and more accessible, like the AutoML, which is a new tool by Google that does the design for you and pretty much lands you in the end of this step. So you have your model, you have it trained, and you have it even fine-tuned. The input that you give to AutoML is just a data set that is tagged. So you give some images, you give the tag which describes what's in each image, and then you have the model that is ready to consume in your code. All you need for that is your Go skills. TensorFlow Hub is a repo where researchers can upload their um, models that they developed as part maybe of their PhD or just for fun, but it's basically models that land you pretty much around this step, and then you can do the training, or if it's already pre-trained, then you can do the retraining part, which is just adding the last step, the fine-tuning fine one. And there are also all kinds of black box tools that just take TensorFlow and give you the API that you can consume it, like MachineBox. And the languages with which you can use TensorFlow are Python, of course, um, C++, Java, Go. JavaScript was added in the beginning of the year, and Swift was just announced yesterday. Python is the main language of data scientists is, of course, the language with which you can do the most in TensorFlow. So you can build models and train them and consume them and so on. And with Go, you can train model. So you need to have a ready one, but you can train it and then you can also consume it. And I want to tell you about our in-house machine learning now. So I work for a company that's called Gray Meta, and that's, uh, they have a platform for curating and creating data based on all the media that you're uploading. And these are the models here are some of my colleagues. I'm not there. And this was our training set. And one of the things that the platform does is face recognition. And we consume all kinds of external APIs, for example, the one by Google or the one by Amazon. But we also said that we want to have something in-house to see maybe the performance of that would be better. And then our step one was define the requirements or define the problem. And it basically the way it works is that the, our clients upload lots of media on their cloud and then hook it to the platform. The platform takes all those files, starts processing. It means that there's thousands of categories where if you remember a category is the outcome of the prediction. So in our case, it's thousands of faces. And the number of those categories is increasing all the time because whenever you upload new types of media, you're gonna have new actors there. And it's happening at any time. So let's say it's not the same like in a medical company that maybe recognizes moles and can say if it's uh, prone to be something that is problematic or not, and then they can add a new model every, or a new category every month or every week. This is not the case. This is a client would one day upload one million files and good luck. It's gonna have to support them all at once now. And the client is usually pretty lazy. So it's not like they're gonna go over each frame of the video and gonna say, this is Brad Pitt, and this is Brad Pitt, and this is Brad Pitt, and this is Brad Pitt, in this frame as well, and this frame. It's gonna be just those two, three frames, and that's it. So that's the training data. And the classifier has to be retrained immediately. So it means that if the first five frames were given the name, the sixth frame has to know already who's that. And it has to make it fast. And all those are the requirements, the pretty ambitious <laughs> requirements that we defined ourselves. And these are the steps we took to implement this. For the gathering of the data, we took a mix of the private data of the faces that you saw. And we added that on top of an existing trained data set with just faces of random people from the internet. And we 
prepared it, we did the pre-processing, we did the normalizing, and then we had to choose a model. And our options were those three, um, custom DLIB based uh, models, which are mostly became irrelevant because they were very experimental, partial, or maybe educational. Then we were considering open face, which is the model by Facebook, and FaceNet, which is the model by Google. And we decided not to go with the custom ones for obvious reasons, and we decided not to go for the Facebook one because we couldn't uh, reproduce their results. And we decided to go for the one from FaceNet, specifically the implementation by Dave Sandberg because it's super active on GitHub. Always a good indicator. And then we built our classifier on top of the output vectors. Now the output vectors is kind of the pre-processed, the post-processed image, but not yet the prediction. So it's kind of translated image, but it still doesn't say who's the face. And then we did the training where each client had a unique model, but it was basically the same base model from step one and just the final training, the last few percents, were done with a specific one that's relevant for each client. And this is all in Go and integrated into the engine, which runs several other similar um, services. And those steps we have not reached yet. <laughs> but if you wanna know how it goes, you're very welcome to follow. I'll definitely update. I find it very interesting myself as well. So these are the numbers that we see right now in our staging environment for each of those three training groups. So the top one, we had uh, all of them were on top of FaceNet, which was trained with 6,000 faces from the internet, and it already had a, uh, a success prediction of 97%. And then adding two fa one face for each of the three colleagues, we then checked the results with 27 for here, the success rate was 78%. Um, for this colleague, we added 19 pictures. The results were better. And for the last colleague, we, the results were pretty much similar. So it's pretty cool. One face is all your training data, and it's over 80% prediction. Let's say we add two or three. It's going to be pretty nice. That's the architecture of how it's built. So we have the FaceNet model in TensorFlow. We have the distance classifier based on top of that. Everything is in a container uh, with which we communicate in just an API that we made. And this, all the models are stored in Redis. And that's as far as we have it at work. And going back to the message that I came with for this talk is Go is all you need to have TensorFlow. I was talking outside earlier with two guys that were asking about this and, but, but Python, right? Machine learning is really much Python. So what I wanna say again is that all you need is just your Go skills and one of the tools. Whether it's AutoML, if you just want to have the data set, the tagged data set, just drop it into that tool and start consuming your model, or take one of the models in the GitHub repo and train it with yourself. The Go API supports doing that as well. And if you want to read more, here is a good list of lots of resources. And of course, there's a big community around TensorFlow as well, and you should be part of it. The Go community needs some love in TensorFlow. It's not the most active one, but this can change. And I definitely hope that after today, some of you will go and maybe contribute some code. And that's it, thank you.